Welcome to the Greater Albuquerque Church of Christ. My name is Josh Peterson and my wife Stacy is here as well to welcome you to our church service online this morning. We're grateful to have you with us. Hopefully everyone had a wonderful Christmas. Probably a little bit different this year, but the things that are important like God and God's family, um, hopefully you were able to focus on those things. I know that even though we are apart physically, the great thing about our church is that we can be together in heart and in spirit. So thank you for being here this morning. Yeah, we're grateful to have the body of Christ in any season. And I want to read a scripture about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And the Bible says in verse 25, God has arranged the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And as we come to the end of this year, we just want to express our gratitude for the body of Christ, our family, brothers and sisters here in Albuquerque. Every part uh, is so important and matters so much, and we're really grateful for you, and we love you all. Today, we get the privilege of hearing from a guest speaker, Mike Tolliver, from the Mission Point Church in San Antonio, Texas. Yeah, that's right. We've been actually wanting to fly Mike out for a couple of years to speak to our church. And of course, now uh, with the magic of technology and the challenges that we face in our society, uh, we're having more and more guest speakers online and um, you know, recorded on camera. So we're really, really grateful, Mike. Thank you so much for preaching for us today. Um, he has a message that I think will connect with all of us in this season. Um, so let's pray for our hearts to be open this morning as we get to hear God's word preached. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the great Christmas season that we've all been able to have. And I pray that you would continue to meet our needs uh, no matter how we feel in this time. God, bless our service today. Be with Mike in a powerful way. And more importantly, God, be with our hearts and allow your word and Mike's words to really help us to draw near to you. Thank you so much for your love for us, God. Thank you for your body, for your church here in Albuquerque. As we close out this year, God, we want your name to be lifted up and glorified in every way. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Enjoy the service. And just as a reminder, this week there will be no midweek and uh, we'll have service online again on January 3rd. Um, yeah. So we'll see you later, people. Okay. Peace out. Bye. <laughs> Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let 
us adore Him, Him Christ, Christ the Lord. Sing choirs of angels, sing in exultation. Sing, all ye citizens of heaven above. Glory to God, all glory in the highest. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Christ the Lord. Yea, Lord, we greet Thee, born this happy morning. Jesus, to Thee be all glory given. Word of the Father, now in flesh appear. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. Luke 10, 25 begins an old familiar passage to many of us. Sometimes we learn new things when we take a fresh look at passages. Let's explore today the Good Samaritan. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You've, done, you've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he came to the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. In verse 25, an expert in the law stands up to test Jesus. He's a scribe. Learned, scribes were learned men whose business was to study the law, transcribe it, and write commentaries on it. They also wrote up documents or contracts as needed. Scripture and tradition was their thing. Ezra in the Old Testament was a very respected scribe. He did a lot of good stuff. They would copy and recopy the Bible meticulously, even counting letters and spaces to ensure that each copy was exactly correct. We can thank the Jewish scribes for accurately preserving the Old Testament portion of our Bibles throughout the centuries, and archaeology confirms this. Still, Jesus corrected them at times for placing their traditions over the Scriptures. You remember the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5.20. Jesus said, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. They were disciplined people, but we must do better than them to enter the kingdom? What does this mean? How could I ever do better than the LeBron James of Judaism? Okay, I'll answer that in a minute. The scribe asks a great question of Jesus, and he's asking the right person. 
What must I do to inherit eternal life? And the answer is not, what emotions do you have? How do you feel? What traditions have you kept? What, what are your opinions? And the scribe does deserve credit for asking Jesus his question. He went to Jesus. And today we want to let God's word do the talking. When we have a question, what does God's word say? We want to trust scripture and not tradition or how we feel or what mood we're in. And so, so the, the scribe does the right thing there in that way. But obviously the scribe's motives are messed up. He's trying to trap Jesus. He's trying to test Jesus like Satan tried in Luke chapter 4. What must I do? It is a great burning question. So Jesus answers his question with a question, as he often did. How do you read it? You know, we think Jesus should just answer all my questions, but actually often he answered a question with a question to lead you to your answer. He asked almost 200 questions in the Gospels because he wants us to think, read, research, reflect, meditate, and dig for ourselves. Like Moses and Paul and David, he wants us to grapple with God's word. He wants us to obey, but he doesn't want mindless puppets. He wants us to chew on his word. At the heart of the word question is the word quest. Jesus will not spoon feed you all your answers. You must be a seeker. So Jesus says, how do you read it? Now that's not a super difficult question because they did actually recite it every day. The Shema, Deuteronomy 6, plus Leviticus 19, 18 gets quoted here. Jesus had answered this question himself similarly on other occasions. Love God and love your neighbor. These two commands are at the heart of the law and the prophets. So the scribe recited the scriptures and Jesus tells him he's correct. Do this and you will live but he wants to justify himself because he's feeling a little guilty. The truth is, yes, if any human being could actually fulfill this law of love to completion, he would indeed attain eternal life. But the scribe knew that he was not doing this. He knew that it is impossible to do this without blemish. And not just two laws are involved. I, I, how do I possibly keep the 400 other laws that are in the Old Testament? Why is it a burning question? Because if you're honest, you have to admit, I can't do this. It is impossible. Imagine a farmer listening to Jesus at the Sermon on the Mount. How do I possibly exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees? On his own, he's thinking, how do I do that? No way. But the answer is not to tithe more strictly, memorize more scripture, give even more to the poor. All of that is good. God bless you. Amen. But we are barking up the wrong tree. Doing stuff will never give you the kind of righteousness that Jesus wants to give you. The problem is in the question itself. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And the answer is, you can't do it. You can't do enough. You will never earn it. You will never deserve it. You will never work yourself to heaven. Your righteousness is a gift from God. You need Jesus. Stop trying to be LeBron scribe or tiger Pharisee in order to be saved. You can't do it. And you know, I love watching LeBron James play basketball. I love watching Tiger Woods play golf. I'm not gonna be like those guys. And praise God, righteousness doesn't depend upon me surpassing anybody. It depends upon me accepting the righteousness that Jesus gives me. Paul wrote about the impossibility of it all in Romans chapter three, verse 20. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Or in Romans 5, verse 12, therefore, just as sin, sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Scribe or farmer, Pharisee or laborer, in this realization of our need is the seed of a relationship with the Almighty God who has been holding out his hand for a long time. Christianity is not some shallow thing. Hey, I did all this, so you owe me heaven. You really do need to be saved. Now, my wife and I, 
We went to Niagara Falls a few weeks ago on our way back from Massachusetts. And I'd been, when I was in high school, uh, stood on the Canadian side. Ambergine had never been, so this time we went and we stood on the American side of the falls. Oh, it's beautiful. It's powerful. Um, it's also overwhelming to see the Niagara River plummet over uh, as it's on its way from uh, Lake Erie to Lake Ontario. And the, the thing that hits you is, as you're standing there, you're looking at the water, the rapids. If you fall in, you die. Um, you can't possibly swim to the other side. There is an impossibility of escape. And when you see that at the river, it's sort of an overpowering thing. Man, if I fall in, I need a savior. I need something dramatic because you simply cannot work your way out of the Niagara River. You're going over the falls without some kind of help. And right now, that's what the scribe should be conscious of. The scribe should say something like the apostles said, well then, who then can be saved? Or in the parable, the man who beat his breast and, and, and said, have mercy on me, Lord, because I'm a sinner. Or Peter, who, who said, away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Honestly, it was time for the scribe to have that moment and to admit, I'm a sinner. I need to be plucked from the river before I go over the falls and am dashed on the rocks. Instead, he tries to justify himself. But you can't outswim the current. You will be dashed on the rocks. You have to be saved. Sometimes we imitate the scribe, don't we? Like when we first study the Bible, we begin reading about sin. We begin reading about things in our lives that we need to change. And we go, me? Lost? Moi? Well, that can't be true, can it? And we try to justify ourselves. Well, all my life I've been a, uh, like the rich young ruler. I've kept these since I was a child. But good works didn't save the scribes and the Pharisees. They didn't save the rich young ruler or, or this lawyer. When confronted with sin in our lives, we often try to justify ourselves. Now, I'll come back to this for us older Christians, but he asks a question, who is my neighbor? So Jesus tells a story. A man is going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, Jerusalem's 3,000 feet above sea level. Jericho is about 1,000 feet below sea level. So it's a 17-mile walk that drops almost a mile in elevation. It is a downhill walk to Jericho. It's mountainous, it's dangerous, uh, it had caves and places to hide nearby the road as it dropped through the mountains. So thieves would rob people on the road. The man was ambushed. He was stripped and beaten, blow upon blow in the Greek, it says, leaving him bloody and half dead. A priest comes down the road. Probably he's just been at the temple, perhaps, offering a sacrifice of some kind. The man, the Jew who's been mugged, is laying on the ground, and he, maybe he looks and he says, help has arrived. But the priest thinks, I might be mugged myself, or I might become unclean if this guy dies, or I'm in a rush, I I'm afraid. So the priest passes by on the other side. Now, sometimes that road is, is 10 feet wide, or sometimes it's just 18 inches wide, it, it, but it wasn't hard to get on the other side of the road and he passes by. Perhaps God is thinking, Ugh, Hosea 6.6, 6, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You walked all the way to Jerusalem to offer a sacrifice, but you will not step a short few feet off this pathway to help your fellow Jewish citizen. Next comes a Levite, and the priest's helper is honestly not any better than the priest. Next comes a Samaritan. Maybe the man thinks, oh no, not a Samaritan. Man, he's, he's just going to kick me while I'm down. Jews and Samaritans often couldn't stand each other, and there were centuries of bitterness between them. But the Samaritan does a beautiful thing. He shows us all how to love. He stops. He feels compassion. He goes to him. He looks at him, investigates, and he did all kinds of good stuff. He bandages him up, pouring on oil and wine. He picks him up. He puts him on his, his donkey. There's blood on the saddle. There's blood on his clothing. He brought him to an inn. He paid for a night at the inn. He stayed overnight with him. The next day, he paid, him two, he paid the innkeeper two denarii. That's about $300 in U.S. terms. 
and he told the guy, I'm coming back and I'll repay you more money for all of your expenses when I come back. Wow, that's amazing. A stranger with a different accent, a different religion, a different race. That's the greatest commandment. Our faith begins here. Let's love people. Let's care about other people. Let's act. That is such a key point. Jesus asks him, which of these three was the neighbor to the man? The one who had mercy on him, he replied. Go and do likewise. Jesus says by doing this, the Samaritan proved himself a neighbor to the man. <laughs> Let me be honest. I think for most of us, have we ever done this? Like ever? I've helped people before, uh, but I have I, I got to admit, I have never done this for a total stranger. Have you saw a victim of crime or bandaged him, carried him to an inn, uh, blood on my car seats, paid, spent a night caring for him, gave 300 bucks to the hotel for his care, came back a couple of days later, checked on him? Have you ever done this? For most of us, the passage, this passage alone, just this one command, <laughs> proves that we're not going to inherit eternal life based on what we have done. And there are 400 more commands to go down the command clipboard checklist coming up. The point is we really need to love people, yes, but also we need to stop trying to justify ourselves. What does this passage prove about me and about you? That only through God can we be saved. In my 20s as a young preacher, I would share this passage and I would talk about real love. And I'd talk about it. Are you loving like this Samaritan? And of course, everyone's convicted and it's true and he's amazing and we need to live like this. And it's absolutely true. Love across racial lines, love that takes pity, love that spends money and spends time and takes risks and isn't concerned about skin color or the accent uh, that the person speaks with. We dare not miss this point that I am in fact, a selfish soul who has walked by people like the priest and the Levite, that it is so easy for me, for us, to hole up in our American homes and not see or help anybody. And that when the church asks us to volunteer or attend a, a 5K or donate to Hope, we struggle to lift a pen and write the check for $52. I am convicted and I want to grow and I want to see people and I want to love them. This is such an important point. The Samaritan loved people like God did. He loved people like Jesus did. But I also dare not miss the relational point. And this is the one that I did miss for a while. Because the question the lawyer asked, what must I do, is a flawed question. Because you can never do enough. You cannot possibly keep all the laws and requirements. And neither could the scribes and the Pharisees as hard as they tried. The only way to surpass the righteousness of the scribes is to let Jesus place his righteousness upon you. It appears the scribe just kind of agreed with what Jesus said and walked away. In verse 37, Jesus said, go and do likewise. In my, I don't know, I think verse 38, there ought to be a verse 38 that reads, but, but Jesus, that's impossible. Uh, hang on a minute. Uh, help me. I, I don't think I'm able to. I, I'm sorry. I've been so arrogant. Please help me with this. But the scribe didn't get it or didn't want to admit it that he needed a savior. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What's the real answer to that question? Accept the fact that you can't earn it. Accept the message of Jesus and embrace God's grace. The only way out of this dilemma is the gift of eternal salvation. It's to embrace the grace of God to believe, repent, confess Jesus, and to be baptized. Just as Israel believed and walked through the Red Sea to freedom, then received the law and then blessings, we too believe and go through the waters of baptism forever freed from sin. Just like the parting of the Red Sea and the salvation of Israel was an amazing work of God, baptism is not where you work or I work. This now, baptism is not where we earn salvation, but rather it is where God works to free you from sin. Why is this important? 
because we're in the same situation as those Jews. Are you still trying to check off your list of salvation essentials? Are you still trying to earn it? Why do we do all that we do after our baptism? Because of love, because of relationship and gratitude. He's our Father. We come out of the waters of baptism. Hey, you've brought me this far. I'm dripping wet. I'm free. I'm with you, Lord. This relationship, relationship moves us all towards spiritual maturity and blessing as we move towards the promised land. Truth is, all of us need to grow deeper in our gratitude and thankfulness to Jesus. That's why we're talking about it today. I grew up in a Bible-believing home, but I wandered far. I lived in sin and hardened my heart toward God. In 1979, I picked up a Bible and began to read, and it touched my heart like it never had before. Do's and don'ts faded away, and they morphed slowly into a relationship with my Lord. And in 1981, I was so fired up to be baptized into Christ. The meaning of that day has grown through the years. When I think about God, I think about the amazing security that He gives. I'm adopted. I'm a part of the family. I'm loved. I think about the awe that I feel, that God did all that for me. I think about the lavish prodigious love that he bestowed upon me. I cannot wait to see him face to face. Imagine if it wasn't true. Imagine if you really did have to earn it. You'd be under pressure to the very end of your life to keep all the commands, to keep the boss happy, to not be kicked off the team. Imagine life as a spiritual minefield. You'd, it'd be like a spiritual America ninja warrior, one slip and you're gone. You'd face death wondering, did I do enough? But that's not Christianity. It's so flat out awesome to enjoy God's grace and to live knowing that I'm loved, that I'm embraced, that I'm accepted by God because he paid the price. I never want it to depend on me. So all of us today, let's remember the Good Samaritan his example of love. Let's up our game. Let's love one another. Let's love the lost. Let's take risks. Let's break the ice in our neighborhood. Let's reach out across racial divides. And all of us today, let's also never forget that Jesus pulled us out of that Niagara River. He saved us. He loved us and has tremendous plans for each and every one of us. Let's chew on that this week. God bless. As we meditate for the communion, we're gonna sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided Follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning
See?